Exodus chapter 3, and I want to read the first few verses tonight, and we're going to ask the Lord to uh, speak to us. Exodus 3, verse number 1. Now Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the backside of the desert, and he came to the mountain of God, even to Horeb. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the middle of a bush. He looked, behold, the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. Now let me just very quickly, before we continue to read, make a comment about the angel of the Lord. Not every time that you find the phrase in the Old Testament, the angel of the Lord, does it represent this. But many times when you find the phrase, the angel of the Lord, it is what is referred to as a Christophany. Now, a Christophany is a long theological word that means a pre-Bethlehem appearance of Christ. Who in the room understands that Jesus did not begin at Bethlehem? In other words, Jesus existed before Bethlehem. He always has been, and he always will be. Jesus is not just the Son of God. He is God the Son. He is God in human flesh, and what Christmas is all about is the incarnation God taken upon himself a human body in order to know what it is to experience uh, pain, loneliness, all of, the, all of the experiences that he went through. But the main reason, and we'll talk about this more at Christmas, but the main reason that God took upon himself a human body was why? To die. God cannot die. And so the Son of God became the Son of Man that sons of men may become the sons of God. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you through his poverty might be made rich. So when the Bible talks about the angel of the Lord, not every instance, but almost all instances, I should say the majority of instances, it is a pre-Bethlehem appearance of Christ. And it is important that you understand Jesus did not begin at Bethlehem. Before Bethlehem was, Jesus was. Uh, Jesus was the earthly name that was given to him. And Bethlehem is God taking upon himself a human body, a body of limitation to stoop, to save, and in order to identify with you and me tonight. Is anyone thankful for that? Now, interestingly enough, the first appearance of the angel of the Lord is in Genesis 18, and it was none other than to Hagar. And uh, she was an Egyptian handmaid. And do you not see the grace of God in the Lord revealing himself to her and going to her and ministering to her. And so you can trace this theme. Uh, many times when you see the angel of the Lord, just think uh, that was Christ uh, before Bethlehem. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit always have been. They always will be. There never was a time when they did not exist. There never will be a time when they will not exist. God the Son, and his mu- God the Son is as much God as God the Father and God the Holy Spirit. And God the Holy Spirit is as much God as God the Father and God the Son. Is anyone thankful for that? Uh, let's think about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Do you remember they were thrown into the fiery furnace? And you remember the king looked into the fiery furnace and he said, I put three in. Uh, yet I see four, and the fourth is like unto the Son of God. Who was that in there in the fire with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? That was Christ, the Lord himself. That was a pre-Bethlehem appearance of Christ. And we can continue to go. We continue to talk about him. And so this is another such instance here in verse 2. The angel of the Lord appeared to him, unto whom? To Moses, in a flame of fire out of the middle of a bush. And he looked. So in other words, Moses looks. And he sees a bush that's burning with fire, and it was not consumed. Now, if I was in a desert, and I saw a bush that was burning, and the bush was burning and it was not consumed, I would like to believe that I would stop long enough to at least pay attention and see what's going on. Who in the room can say amen to that? Some of you are depressed tonight. No more baseball to watch, and you're just down in the dumps, and... We're going to give you a counseling hotline number that you can call for help. Amen? But, I mean, you're walking through the desert. you got your phone. You're you're on your social media. You're talking. I'd like to believe if there was a bush that was burning in the desert and it was not consumed, you'd at least put your phone down and look to see what's going on. Amen? And so Moses, that's what he does. Verse 3, he says, I'm going to turn aside and I'm going to see this great sight, why the bush is not burnt. And when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God waits to see if you're curious enough to turn to him. Here is a New Testament uh, verse for this Old Testament principle. Draw near to God and he will 
draw near to you. Verse 4 says, when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called to him out of the middle of the bush and said, Moses, Moses, and Moses said, here am I. Now, you're in a desert, you're walking, you see a bush, a thorn bush, it's burning, it's not consumed. That gets your attention, yes or no? But then all of a sudden you turn aside and a voice starts talking to you out of the bush and then that voice calls you by name. I I think that would at least warrant you stopping what you're doing and saying, I'd like to find out what's going on here. Amen? Amen? And so the voice calls out to him and says, Moses, Moses, he said, here am I. He said, don't come any closer. Draw not nigh hither. Don't come any closer. Take your shoes off of your feet. The place that you're standing is holy ground. Moreover, he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. What a story. Is anyone thankful for this story? Now, as Exodus opens, there are many years that elapse between the closing of Genesis and the opening of Exodus, so much so that as you are familiar, the book of Exodus opens with the following statement, that there would arise a king, there arose a king who knew not Joseph. So there was a time that elapsed, a span of time that elapsed between the closing of Genesis and the opening of the book of Exodus. And it's interesting by now, the children of Israel are found in severe bondage. They're in oppression. They're down in Egypt. They're being persecuted. You remember the story of Pharaoh, and you remember all that's going on. And God, in order to deliver his people, is preparing a leader that he is going to raise up. Deuteronomy 18 tells us that God was going to raise up a prophet like unto Moses, and we certainly understand that was one of the foreshadows and types of the coming of the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. But don't you love to study the life of Moses? His life can best be described and broken down into three different periods of time in his life. Forty-year periods to be exact. In the first 40 years, he is a prince being raised in Pharaoh's court. In his second 40 years, he is a shepherd on the backside of the desert in Midian, tending the flock of his father-in-law, Jethro. In the third 40 years, he is anointed as a leader and as a ruler of God's people, and God is going to use him in a great and mighty way. Now, when we come to this passage, Moses is in obscurity. God is preparing Moses in order to do a work in him and do a work through him, and this is what we come commonly referred to as the call of God upon the life of Moses, the burning bush experience. And it tells you and me and it teaches you and me of the kind of person that God will use. Someone asked this question. I, I read this question years ago. I cannot remember exactly who penned these words. But they asked this question, am I a person that God uses or am I a person that uses God? I think that's probably a good question for all of us to consider. But as we work our way through these verses, there are several lessons that I want to give us tonight. First of all, verse 1, I want to talk about a lesson on persistence. Now, notice what he says in verse 1. Moses kept, that word means to tend, the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the backside of the desert. He came to the mountain of God, even to Horeb. Now, remember Moses, remember this, was literally reared uh, in royalty, in the lap of luxury, and he was highly educated. Uh, And if you go back and study, you will discover all that took place in his life. Do you remember how God sovereignly preserved his life, sovereignly protected his life? And now here he is. He's being raised in the lap of luxury. He's being raised literally as royalty. And I mean, uh, some have even said, uh, I'm not sure of this, but some have even said that the education that he obtained back in those days would be equivalent maybe to a Ph.D. today. So he was a brilliant man. He was a smart man. He was a learned man man. He was an educated man. And now you you come to this chapter when God's about to speak to him. And where do you find Moses? He's on the backside of the desert. What's he doing? He's leading some uh, sheep. I mean, he's being a shepherd. Who's he doing it for? He's doing it for his father-in-law. I'm sure every man in the room would like to work for their father-in-law. I mean, I'm just sure every man in the room, it would just be peachy, would it not, to work for your father-in-law. I mean, can you imagine the first 40 years? Anyone listening to what we're talking about today? I mean, can you imagine the first 40 years of your life through the sovereign hand of God to protect you, keep his hand on you, you're, you're learning all of these skills, and now all of a sudden it's your time to shine, right? It's your hour, and here you are. What are you doing, man? You're, you're a shepherd, 
And, and where are you taking care of these sheep? On the backside of the desert. No one knows where you are. Everyone's forgotten all about you. No one knows your address. No one's asking you to come sign their book. And you're working for your paw in law. And you're taking care of a few little sheep and you're doing it on the backside of the desert. Is anyone getting this? Now, how would you like to go to school? How would you like to spend these years being prepared? How would you like to have all of these opportunities at your fingertips? And now all of a sudden, God takes you, lifts you up, and puts you on the backside of the desert in obscurity where no one even knows who you are. I'm going to tell you, there's a biblical principle that all of us in the room need to learn, and here it is. God will never allow you to do what's in your heart until you, first of all, die to your dream. And I've met a lot of people with a lot of ambition that want to do a lot of things for the Lord, and they got more zeal than sense, and there's nothing wrong with zeal. And there's not even anything wrong with not having any sense when you first start out. But somewhere along the line, you need to learn some stuff. Amen? And if when you had no sense, you had zeal, how much more zeal should you have now that you got a little sense? You'll catch that later on. I mean, amen? If i got to do the preaching and the amen, and we're going to be here till Sunday. Come on now, amen? And I'm telling you, God never used anyone in the Bible that firstly did not die to their dream so that God could test their heart and so that they could see that they wanted God more than they wanted the dream. Now, we don't have time to talk about this all night. Let's just give one quick example. Do you remember Abraham? God said to Abraham, I'm going to give you a son. Do you remember this? It's in the Bible. It's a good book. You ought to read it every once in a while. I mean, Abraham's 100, wife's 90. God says, you're going to have a child. 190-year-old, and they're looking for a home next to an elementary school. Who knows what I mean? <laughs> Woo! Yes or no? I just, I think I'd die, yes or no. 100 years old, 90 years old, you're going to have a child. And so God gives them a child. And when you get to Genesis 22, do you know what it says? It came to pass that God did test Abraham and said, take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and bring to a mountain that I'm going to show you. And, and when you read Genesis 22, when it says, God did test Abraham and said, take your son whom you love. The word love in the Hebrew implies who you prefer. And what the Lord is saying is, you've waited for 25 years for the promise to come to pass. I've given you a promise. Now here's the fulfillment of the promise. But now you're worshiping the gift over the giver. And how many times have we in our own lives in this room asked God for stuff only to have God give us what we ask for, and then what we've asked for becomes detrimental to us and our walk with God because we worship the gift more than the giver of the gift. And that's exactly what the language indicates in Genesis 22. Take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, which literally means whom you prefer, and what God was saying, whom you prefer over me. And I want you to take him to a mountain that I'm going to show you. And do you remember the story? And we picture, you know, most of, the, most of the little coloring sheets in Sunday school that you and I color on Abraham and Isaac have Isaac as a little child, but he was at least a teenager, probably 20 years of age. And it took just as much faith for Isaac to go as it did for Abraham to take him. And they go up the mountain. Does anyone remember that story? And here's Abraham, and he takes Isaac, and Isaac says, you know, where is the lamb? And Abraham says, my son, my God will provide himself a lamb as a sacrifice. You better believe he will. And do you remember the Lord showed him a ram caught by the horn in the thicket and said, take him and sacrifice him in the place of your son. For now I know that you fear God. And Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. Does anyone remember that story? Now what's the whole point? It was not until Abraham was willing to die to his dream that God was willing to raise it up and resurrect it and do a work. And God will only use us when we're willing to die to our dream. There's nothing wrong with passion. There's nothing wrong with zeal. I'll never forget when I was 18 years old and I surrendered to preach, and I just signed up to be the next Billy Graham. And I was ready to write Billy Graham. I mean, after all, he said, all you got to do is write Billy Graham on the envelope. You don't need anything else on the address, and he'll get it. Even Santa had to have North Pole. Who knows what I mean? Billy Graham was a big deal. I mean, all you had to do is write Billy Graham on the envelope. He'd get it, yes or no. And so I was going to write Billy Graham and write him a letter and say, hey, your replacement's here. Here I am. 18 years old, whole lot of zeal, no sense whatsoever. And I'm telling you, uh, the Lord had to do a whole lot of chipping away. And I can tell you all of these years later, he's still doing it. 
And I'm just going to speak to the young people, the middle-aged people, the older people in the room. You want to do a work for God? Go get them, tiger. But I'm telling you, until you're willing to humble yourself and until you're willing to be content on the backside of the desert, if that's where you've got to be in order to be in the will of God and honor God, you can have all these plans and dreams all you want to, but you'll stumble all over yourself your entire life and be nothing but miserable. And there's nothing wrong with setting goals. There's nothing wrong with aspirations and dreams and plans. The heart of man plans his way, but the Lord directs his steps. And the lesson of Moses, before we even dive into it, is the Lord is trying to teach Moses a lesson on persistence, and he's trying to get all of us to understand the kind of person that God uses is a person that allows the Lord to develop character deep within him. Now, what do we know about Moses from verse 1? He was a man of commitment. He says, verse 1, he kept the flock. He was a shepherd. He was willing to do what God wanted him to do. Could he have thought to himself, I'm made for more than this. I'm destined for more than this. I'm too good for this. What in the world am I out here doing tending these sheep? You better believe he could have thought that, ladies and gentlemen. But if that's what God calls you to do, then get on the backside of the desert. Take care of the sheep. Don't murmur and complain. Do it with joy in your heart and do it as unto the Lord and not to man and do it with everything that you have. Amen? He was a man of commitment. He was being faithful to God in the little things. He was a man of character. He was a shepherd. It was poor employment in particular and especially for a man of his background and education. I mean, it was a blow to the pride. God's teaching him meekness and patience and character. God's teaching him some things. What is the lesson of this verse? Be faithful where God has placed you. Be satisfied with what God has given you. Don't go around with a chip on your shoulder acting as if you deserve better or as if you're worth more. But be faithful with what God has given you and where God has placed you. And just be faithful to the Lord. God will honor faithfulness. Amen? The Lord had to really, really massage this in my heart. And I don't even like talking about it because by me talking about it, I guess I'm scared you think I've arrived and I've learned this lesson. Or it, I, I'm scared maybe that I'm given that impression. And I can promise you I have not. And I'm not going to lie to you because I don't want God to kill me tonight. Amen? I mean, I'm 29 years old. We're pastoring in Mississippi and... Man, you know, friends are telling me this and that, you, you, whatever. You've all been there. And the Lord says, I want you to walk away from this church. I want you to go on the road. I want you to go preach where I tell you to go preach. And I want you to do what I tell you to do. And man, one week I'd preach at a church, have 10 people. I went to one church, it was, and, and it was on a road called Hog Chain Road. It, there's no phone that would tell you how to get to Hog Chain Road. <laughs> Amen? I'm out knocking on doors, asking people, how do you get to the church? And I'm just telling you, listen to me, listen, I'm not telling you I've learned the lesson. I'm still a learner. But I'm telling you during those years, I had to learn, be content. Be content. Are you listening to what I'm telling you? Be content. I'd go this week, preach to a church, have 10. Go the next week, preach to a church, have 20. Go the next week, preach to a church, have 2,000. Go the next week to a church, have 50. And you just get up and give it all you got. And, and, and the Lord would continually speak to me, you just get up and preach. You don't have any way of knowing who's in that group of 10 or who's in that group of 20 or who's in that group of 50 that I'm going to get a hold of and use to shake the world for the glory of God. You just be faithful. And if I lead you to the backside of the desert to take care of some sheep, you get to the backside of the desert as quickly as you can at once. Salute me. Say, yes, sir. Quit arguing. Quit negotiating your pay. Get out there and do what I've told you to do. Be faithful in the little things. And if you'll be faithful in the little things, I'll choose to give you more responsibility when I'm good and ready. And the lesson of Moses is be faithful where God has placed you. Amen? I didn't, I didn't come up with this, but I wish I had. Here it is, if you and I are too big for the small jobs, we're too small for the big jobs. And everyone said amen. Well, there's a lesson on persistence. Secondly, verse 2, there's a lesson on problems. Now, if you and I are going to be used by the Lord, we're going to have to learn how to face some problems. We're a lot like a tea bag. We're not worth much till we've gone through hot water. (laughs) 
Is that on? Can, can, y'all, can y'all hear? Can you hear? <laughs> Hello? Amen? Two weeks ago, I stuck my tongue out at the camera. Don't make me do that to you tonight. <laughs> There's some wise people in this church that captured that and, and made it a meme and, and sent it to me. It's, it's really blessed me. I'm very thankful for that. You know, whatever you do comes back to you. And everyone said amen. If you and I are too big for the small jobs, we're too small for the big jobs. There are no small jobs. There are no big jobs. When God calls you to an assignment, it's vital. Amen? Man, I'm going to tell you something. Um, you know, who am I to stand up here and talk about this? But um, I can remember when uh, Julie and I had Luke and Keeley, and, 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 you know, people would always come up to her and, and say, do you work? And, and, and you ladies can relate, yes or no? And, and this society puts such a, a stigma uh, you know, do, oh, you're just a housewife. <laughs> just a housewife. I wouldn't last two days. Can I get an amen from, from all the men in the house? Can I get a witness? Yes or no? Just a housewife. How about you zip it? Amen? And, and, the, and the picture is, you know, all of us, no matter where we are in life, no matter what we're going through in life, we, we face these struggles you know, men deal with this, women deal with this, younger people deal with this, older people deal with this. I mean, we all deal with it. You know, when, when preacher, will I get to a point where I no longer struggle with this? Well, it's, it's older than 49. Because I still have to deal with it. it, it it's a lesson to you and me on problems that we're going to go through stuff in life and God's going to purge us. Now, now look at what it says, verse 2. The angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the middle of a bush, and he looked, behold, the bush was burning with fire, and it was not consumed. Out of the middle, from the center of this bush, and it was consumed. It was not consumed. It was not burned up. The angel of the Lord out of the bush. Now, God is using this thorn bush to try to teach him some important lessons on problems. Someone wrote a book on this, believe it or not, and the simple question that was asked, why that particular thorn bush? And the answer was, because anyone will do. The miracle was not the thorn bush. The miracle was the God in the thorn bush. Can anyone say amen to that? It was an ordinary thorn bush that was used in extraordinary ways. Why? Because of God in it and his presence in it. And the message to Moses was, just like this thorn bush, I will use you. Now, fire in your Bible is often a picture of refinement and judgment and suffering and persecution. God was teaching him some things about what it is to be a suffering saint. He was saying to him, just like this bush is on fire, you and the nation of Israel are going to go through a time of testing. You're going to go through a time of refinement. You're going to go through the fire. I wish that I could say to everyone in this room that if you get close to Jesus, say your prayers, get you an everyday with Jesus Bible, read your Bible through. I I wish that I could say to you, you'll never have a problem. No one will ever pick on your kids. No one will ever look at you wrong. No one will ever get mad at you on the interstate. I would like to be able to tell everyone in the room, just come on to the altar, pray, give your life to Jesus. You'll never have problems. Your water bill will never go up. Your electric bill will never go up. Your taxes will never go up. Everything will be great. I wish I could tell you that. Don't you wish I could tell you that? And some people just keep telling it, knowing it's not the truth, but they just keep telling it. And it's not truth. I wish I could tell you that. But what I can tell you is just like this bush was burning, but it was not consumed, if you recognize the Lord's presence in your life, you may go through the fire, but you will not burn up. You may burn, but you will not burn up. Why? Because of a sovereign Savior. Because the miracle was not the thorn bush, it was the God in the thorn bush. And God was trying to say to Moses, like this thorn bush, you're going to go through fire. And I'm here to tell all of you tonight, we, all of us, we're going to go through fire. Times of testing. Amen? Y'all don't want to amen. <laughs> you know, pass a list up, sign up for it. I mean, everybody sign up. You're going to get it. You say, well, I don't want to get it. Well, you're going to get it. Well, I'm going to pray it doesn't happen. It's going to happen. Well, is there something I can do to pray to keep it from happening? No. You're going to be more like Jesus, and Jesus is patient. 
And the only way to get patience is, according to the Bible, trials bring patience. I don't want it, you don't want it, but, you know, you learn stuff. Who likes experience? Only problem is you got to go through stuff to get it. Yes? Amen? you got to go through stuff, right? Well, can you tell me how you can have a happy marriage and have disagreements, have arguments? and, and so? Well, the only way you're going to learn from someone about that is someone that's gone through that, right? Quit reading books of doctors telling you how to have a happy marriage, and they've been married 22 times. <laughs> quit getting books. I'm telling you, quit reading these books from doctors telling you how to raise kids, and they've never had kids. Right or wrong? Get you a couple in this church been married 60, 65, 70 years, and we got some. Go eat dinner with them. Take notes. Do what they say. Amen? Are you listening? Well, preacher, I want to teach a marriage conference. No, no. We'll let the ones been married 70 years teach us. Amen. Good preaching, Brother Jerry. Now, now what's the... Mm-hmm. Amen? I like to hang around Edgar and Jean. How, how many years have you been married? 69. 69 years. See, that's who I want to learn from. Amen? And they, and they still play games, and they stay up to midnight playing games, and they want to win, and they don't like to lose. Who knows what I'm talking about? 69 years, okay? Now, I'm just telling you, they, they could tell us tonight about pain, about suffering, and about fire. I've heard them share some stories. They've gone through stuff. We've got many couples in this church that are a testament to the grace of God and the sovereignty of God, and that if you just stay close to Jesus, you're going to go through some fire, but you're not going to be burned up. Amen? Amen. See, that's why the younger need to hang around the older, and the older need to hang around the younger, and we all need to be together because the rest of us birds need to learn some stuff. Amen? So what's he, tre- what's he teaching us? He's teaching us there's going to be some problems that you go through. There's a third lesson. Let's move quickly. Verse 3 and 4. There's a lesson on pursuing. Now, verse 3, Moses said, I'm going to turn aside and I'm going to see this great sight. Why the bush is not being burnt? And when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called unto him out of the middle of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, here am I. It's a lesson on pursuing. Now, notice the curiosity of Moses. He turned aside to see. Now, let's be honest. The reason many of us don't hear the voice of God is when things like this are happening, I mean, you're in the desert, there's a thorn bush, it's burning, it's not being consumed. The the reason that we miss it is we're in such a mad dash and a mad rush all of the time, we don't ever stop long enough to turn aside and see. I can just tell you, very few times have I had the Lord speak to me when I'm in a mad rush. Most of the time, it's what the Bible says, be still and know that I am God. Amen? Amen. And, and, and when you're in a mad rush and you're always moving, always oh, dude, dude, go, 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 go. Every second has to be filled. Every second of your day has to be filled with activity, and there's never a time to be still. Listen, let God speak to you. It's going to be very difficult to hear the voice of God. I didn't say impossible, but it is going to be very difficult to hear the voice of God. And I would like to at least believe that the lesson all of us have learned is that we'd at least stop long enough to be curious enough to see what's going on here. What's God trying to say? And to the extent that I'm willing to be curious to draw near to the Lord and pursue the Lord, I'll hear his voice. So now watch the progression. Moses turns and says, I'm going to see what's going on here. And as soon as God sees him turn, verse 4, God calls to him out of the middle of the bush and said, now what would have happened if Moses would have just kept going? You say, well, God could have got his attention, and of course he could have. But I'm telling you, listen, there are times I'm convinced we miss out on hearing God speak to us because we won't stop and turn to go listen and be curious. He turns to the Lord. God calls him. And as soon as Moses turns, God calls to him. He addresses him by name. And he says, Moses, Moses. Now, if you ever watched these movies, uh, it probably had to have happened the way the movies say, Moses, Moses. That's probably. <laughs> Amen? Amen. <laughs> That's probably the way that it, way that it, way that it happened. I, I don't know, but nevertheless, he was called by name. Now, I mean, you, again, you've got to think about this. You're on the backside of the desert. What are you doing? You're just doing what God told you to do. I mean, you're just taking care of sheep, working for your father-in-law, being faithful, doing what God said. That's where God placed you. You could have been pitching a fit because you're out there having to do this. 
But you're out there doing what the Lord says, and all of a sudden God says, okay, I'm going to settle down and show up and talk to you. You turn aside to see what's going on, God calls. You got this bush, it's burning, it's not consuming. What would that look like? I don't know, but I mean, it had to be something, right? I mean, it's burning, it's not burning, but not burning up. And then all of a sudden, a voice, I mean, not every day that a voice talks to you out of a bush. Right? I mean, at least here in Texas, can I get a name in? <laughs> and then the voice calls you by name and got it right. And not once, but twice. And so he, he Moses, Moses. And then notice what he tells him. He goes, don't come any closer. Stay where you are. Take off your shoes. The spot you're standing is holy ground. I should say so. It's a lesson on pursuing. Let me give you another lesson very quickly. It's a lesson on praise. Now the Lord says to him, don't come any closer, verse 5. Take your shoes off of your feet. Now look, let me just tell you, all keep your shoes on. Amen. <laughs> keep your shoes on. But, but, but God says to him, don't come any closer. Take your shoes off of your feet. The spot you're standing is holy ground. It, it's a lesson on praise. Don't come any closer. And really, very quickly, we close. I want to just highlight what the Lord's trying to tell him and tell you and me. This is how we approach God. This is a lesson on worship. This is a lesson on praise. This is a lesson on how we approach God. Don't come any closer. Take your shoes off of your feet. The spot you're standing is holy ground. Now, what does this teach us? Very quickly, let's just examine it. Here it is. Number one, it teaches me honor. It's a sign of respect. In other words, to take off your shoes means you're showing respect for the Lord. I believe we ought to respect the Lord. Amen. Amen. Now, you know, every generation has rules. I remember one time I showed up at church. Y'all remember that phase? <laughs> Some of you, you know, those of you my age, you remember that phase we used to wear these penny loafers without socks? Y'all remember that? No, you don't remember that? Have you lost your mind? Have you bumped your head? Are you okay? You have amnesia? Who remembers tonight? And so, you know, I went through that stage, and I showed up one Sunday when I was old enough to drive to church. I drove to church, Luke, and I walked in, and I had those. Well, I was so proud of those, man, those penny loafers. And and, and, and no socks, and had my shirt, no belt. Now, look, there's no, listen to me before y'all all go act cray-cray. There's nowhere in the Bible that it says there's something wrong with not having socks or a belt. But in John Chaddock's house, there was. <laughs> Amen? Who understands what I'm talking about? Amen? There was no book, no chapter, no verse. It was just that's the way. And I showed up. <laughs> like I wanted to, because I'm old enough, and I can drive, and I'll dress how I want to. Anyone know what I'm talking about? Isn't it amazing how spiritual all of you act when we get to church? Y'all all look at me like, no, I've never. Done. You, yeah, you were worse, 10 times worse. And so uh, dad said, uh, 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 son, come with me just a minute. So we walked outside. <laughs> he walked me over to the car, and he pointed to the road, and our house from the church where we went to church is about two miles. He said, you see that road right there? I said, yes, sir. He said, you get in that car. You march yourself back to the house. You put you on some socks and a belt. And you better get yourself back to church. And you better not miss a minute of it. Do I make myself clear? I said, yes, sir. I said, do I have to tell you? He said, do I have to tell you what I'm going to do to you if you're not back on time with socks and a belt? Yeah, Dad, could you explain to him? No, I didn't have to ask. I, I didn't have to ask. I didn't have to ask. I've got to speak slowly and distinctly when I tell these kinds of stories because they're so... So I got in the car, I went home, and I came back. Now, I want to be very clear. Just listen to me, please. Uh, you know, we all have rules, right, that we abide by in our home. Poor Keely, and she's not here to defend herself. She was a little, little... When we went to a ball game and they were playing the national anthem and she was just dancing and all over the, you know, doing gymnastics in a headstand and she didn't know any better, and, but she knew better after that. Who knows what I'm talking about? And now you ought to watch her. I mean, she snaps, even to this day, she snaps to attention. I mean, yes or no? I mean, she got, <laughs> she got the what for that night. Does anyone know what I'm talking about? We're going to have parenting classes here at MIMS, Amen. Okay, now, now look, is there a book and a chapter and a verse that says 
uh, if you don't have socks or a belt on, you know, the judgment of God's going to follow it. No, there's not. There, there's not. So everyone relax and don't, don't, for a minute, don't go thumbing through your Bible, just relax. But the principle is, I think the principle of what my dad was trying to get across to me is, could we show a little honor to the Lord? Now, I know this is not where God lives. And I get that there's some people that have this strange obsession with honor in a building, which I think we should. But then when they walk out of the building, they do what they want. And, and that's hypocrisy. We don't change what we do to come to a building. We're the church when we get here. And all of it's true. But it's okay to have a little honor and respect. Yes or no? You know, I've had people say, well, I can't lie to you in the church house. Well, you shouldn't, but neither should you outside. Amen? <laughs> right or wrong? <laughs> when I preach, I'm in church. i got to tell the truth. I mean, I hear that every week. People tell me, you know. But outside the church, they'll tell me I'll be there Sunday, and they're never here. But nevertheless, <laughs> well, <laughs> what's the point? The, the, the point is, take your shoes off. Why? Because you're in the Lord's presence. Let's honor him. Second principle, much deeper, holiness. Now, now, shoes in those days are not like the shoes that we wear. And to even talk about sandals are not like the sandals that we wear. Literally and truly, there was not much to them. It was really just a leather strap, and it was not a whole lot to it. And feet would often get dirty when they would walk back in those days, which is why they'd wash your feet when you'd get to a home. You remember reading this in the Bible. You see, shoes were only a piece of leather, and feet would get dirty. And what he was saying is... Man, you need to recognize in the Lord's presence, take off your shoes. Why? You're on holy ground. Why? Without holiness, no man will see the Lord. God's a holy God. You can live like the devil and teach math. You can live like hell and teach poetry. You can live as an adulterer and teach philosophy. But you cannot live that way and faithfully teach the Bible. Because without holiness, no man will see the Lord. And it's not that we earn the approval of the Lord because the only thing holy about us is the Holy One, and His name is Jesus. And the only way for me to be holy is for me to abide in Him. It's nothing I do. It's nothing I achieve. It's all Him. And He says, pull off your shoes. You're on holy ground. It pictures humility. We're almost finished. Take off your shoes. Yes, it was a sign of respect, but it was also a sign of personal defilement. You see, in those days, people made their own shoes. Julie and Luke, in those days, people made their own shoes. <laughs> My family's philosophy is if the shoe fits, buy one in every color. Who knows what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> and a shoe to someone then represented their self-worth. It's something I made. Look what I made. It's valuable to me. It's precious to me. Look what I did. If I could make a pair of shoes, I'd be proud of them as well. And the Lord was saying, take off your shoes. Why? Because in my presence, there is no strutting. In my presence, there is no arrogance and no pride. In my presence, only one gets the glory. His name is Jesus. And if I'm going to come into the presence of the Lord, I've got to lay aside my achievements, my accomplishments, my resume, all that I've done. God is not impressed. You ever been around a name dropper? I said, have you ever been around a name dropper? No matter what you say, I mean, they're going to one-up your story. It just, it, no matter. You, you ever been around someone like that? I had a steak the other day, man, it was the bill. Well, I'll tell you right now, I had one the other day twice the size. And I'll tell you, you, you think that's good? Who's ever been around that, yes or no? Well, I got to go to the Astros game. Well, I'll tell you right now, I own the Astros. <laughs> and we just go on and on and on. <laughs> Well, what's the principle? If I'm going to come into the Lord's presence, i got to lay aside all of... Hey, the, listen, folks, listen. The ground is level at the foot of the cross. There are no big shots. There are no little shots. 
There's just Jesus. He calls all the shots. There's, 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 no, there's no first class in the kingdom of God. Are you listening? With a little curtain that closes. I've never understood that little curtain that closes. You can see right through it. Who knows? Yes or no? I mean, I'm in seat eight. There's first class. I'm with the unwashed masses. There's first class. I get pretzels. They get stroganoff. And there's this little plastic curtain, and I can see right there. I mean, there they are. That, that's not the way it is in the kingdom of God. Is anyone thankful for that? We, we've got to come down from our high horse and stop all that. I mean, I really believe a church ought to be a place where everybody is somebody and Jesus is Lord. And I really believe that we ought to reach the ones Jesus died for, and the last I checked, that was everyone. Take off your shoes. Then he closes very quickly by saying, by saying verse 6, Moreover, he said, I'm the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon the Lord. Now, what's the point? Just very quickly, do you notice he said to him, I am, I am, not I will be or I was, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Abraham been dead a while. And yet the Lord's telling him, I am the God of Abraham. Hello, somebody. Now, what's the point? Well, you read Luke 20, 37, 38, you will discover they are all alive. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And I'm telling you, for the soul that dies and knows the Lord, there's no such thing as death. We're more alive then than we've ever been. And God says, I want you to know I am right now the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob. Is anyone thankful? And the Bible says Moses hid his face from the Lord's presence because he knew he was on holy ground and he knew he was in the presence of holiness. And that's what Brother Allen was talking about a while ago. When God really does show up, we're not popping our bubble gum. We're not cutting up. We're not being silly. Man, just to be in his presence. Nothing's like it. Amen? So here's the question real quick. Are you a person that uses God or a person God uses? You say, preacher, I want to be a person God uses. Guess what? God wants you to be that kind of person. Understand in life, you're going to go through problems. Understand in life, be persistent. Understand in life, watch this, learn some praise. Learn what it is to worship him and come into his presence. God's going to teach you and me that we're going to go through fire. But if we know him, we're never going to be burned up. We're never going to be consumed. God said we're going to make it. God said we're going to make it. God said we're going to make it. 